You're listening to the All People Podcast, sponsored by Go Sherm, where we celebrate the essential elements of DEI that unite all people. And now, here are your podcast hosts, Ms. Lakita Harmon and Dr. Nadia Saluk. Thanks so much again for tuning in to another episode of the All People Podcast with myself, Lakita Harmon, and my fabulous co-host, Nadia Saluk. We want to welcome you again, and today we are diving into a great topic. It's a topic that many have heard about, but few fully understand, and that is microaggressions in the workplace. And with this topic, so it, it's so much to talk about that we're actually going to have this a two-part episode. So we have two incredible guest speakers with us today, and then in part two, we're going to have another um, you know, two speakers that are joining us for that conversation as well. When we think about microaggressions in the workplace, you know, this term, it may seem new to some, but the impact of these subtle, often unconscious behaviors is deeply felt by those who actually experience them. And in this special two-part series, we're going to be shedding light on real stories from individuals who have, you know, faced microaggressions firsthand. And our goal is simply not to just inform, but to spark meaningful conversations about what these behaviors look like, and more importantly, how can we all learn, grow, and evolve from them? So let's break the silence and create a more inclusive and respectful workplace environment together. And, uh, you know, Lakita, when I was writing my dissertation and I started the process in about 2012, uh, my dissertation focused on the topic of workplace discrimination. But you have to do extensive research on all types of discrimination. And the term microaggressions wasn't anything that was coming up in the literature. But as the years progressed, uh, you know, I did start seeing um, more literature on it. But I really wanted to just give a little bit of a background of where the term came from, because it's been something that, we've, that he, we hear now. It's a more of a newer term, whereas 13, 14 years ago, it wasn't commonly used. But actually, the term microaggression uh, was coined in 1970 by Chester M. Pierce, and he was a Harvard University psychiatrist. And he came up with the term because he had witnessed non-Black Americans inflicting on African Americans uh, this this subtle discrimination. And um, you know, when you look at the term microaggression, uh, it's encompasses like everyday slights. Uh, and comments that relate to various aspects of one's appearance or identity, uh, such as class, gender, sexual orientation, race, and ethnicity. And uh, it's uh, more uh, coined as a covert racism versus overt racism, where uh, it's very obvious. Uh, this is more um, less obvious. And then also it's more common and it's usually uh, unintentional. But it still uh, is the receiver of the microaggression still has a feeling of uh, being disrespected and disregarded. And mm -hmm. so just really wanted to uh, focus on how this has affected individuals in the workplace. And I'm really excited for us to move forward with this conversation. I definitely know this is going to be an incredible conversation today, Nadia. So why don't we just go ahead and introduce these two phenomenal women that we have joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and start with, um, you know, Miss Deloria Nelson Street. You know, there's so much I can definitely say about her. Um, I've known her definitely for some time. I've collaborated with her in different ways. And then we're also a part of a professional women's organization called Women on the Rise. But I can sit here and talk all day about her, but I think her bio itself is going to do a little bit more of a better job. So let me just jump right into that. Ms. Deloria Nelson Street, she is the president of Authentic Culture and Engagement Solutions Incorporated, otherwise known as ACE. ACE is a dynamic coaching and consulting firm that focuses on providing solutions to executives who want to successfully navigate their organizations while authentically standing in their truth, as well as companies who want to embrace and strengthen their culture through authentic engagement and inclusion. In her last corporate role, Deloria was the market, uh, managing director, excuse me, of diversity and inclusion for Charles Schwab and Company, where she led the international inclusion efforts for the firm. Since starting ACE in 2018, Deloria has been recognized as one of the top coaches in Orlando in 2022 and in 2023. 
her coaching, curriculum design, and facilitation with the Black Border Leadership Institute won a 2023 Award for Innovation, and she was recently recognized by the Orlando Business Journal as a woman who means business. <laughs> Valoria is a published author and amazing speaker who has worked professionally in human resources for more than 25 years with various Fortune 500 companies, including Walt Disney World, DEI assessments, leadership training, coaching, employee relations, and inclusions are some of the areas of transformational, and transformational impact. Deloria has a BA degree in mass communications and an MPA with a human resource concentration from Clark Atlanta University. Deloria's personal brand is positive energy, courage, authenticity, and an uplifting spirit. Her workshops and keynotes are engaging, educational, and transformational. Her commitment to DEI, it stems from her personal mission statement, which encapsulates helping people find and leveraging their unique gifts. Everybody, please welcome Miss Deloria Nelson Street. <laughs> that was a long bio, but thank you. <laughs> Well, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Alina Mai. Uh, Alina Mai, she's a 24-year-old uh, graduate student of industrial and organizational psychology at the University of Central Florida. Go night. Uh, she is also an HR generalist at Community Legal Services, so I have the pleasure of working with her uh, on a daily basis. And she is of Vietnamese uh, descent and plans to use her education and skills to continue to be an HR professional that encourages diversity and acceptance in the workplace. In her spare time, Alina loves challenging herself with puzzles and escape rooms. I think what it's been over 50 escape rooms, Alina, that you've participated in. I've done over 130 at this point. Oh, gosh, wow. way off. <laughs> I only did one and barely made it through. Yeah, I'm going to hang with her so I don't get stuck because I'll be scared. <laughs> Kudos to you for that, Alina. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, along with that, she's also a huge horror movie fanatic and spends evenings with her two cats. Artemis and Hollow. So welcome, Alina. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yay! So, like I said, two phenomenal guest speakers joining us today. Um, great conversation that we have been looking forward to having for some time. So without further ado, why don't we just go ahead and jump right on in? Let's start off with the first question I have here. And that is, ladies, can you share a personal experience that you may have had with microaggressions, whether it was, for example, a victim or as a witness? Yeah, I can jump in on that one. I remember it like yesterday, and I was actually kind of a witness, kind of a victim, because it was concerning my daughter, who was a first grader of, at a local elementary school. And mm. my daughter was an avid reader. She always loved reading. So I went to the parent-teacher conference and I asked the teacher, I said, is Asha, that's my daughter's name, is mm -hmm. Asha in the highest reading group? And she was like, no. And I said, wow, I'm shocked because, you know, she's such an avid reader. And then she looked back and she said, she did amazing on the test. I just thought she guessed. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and I was just like, wow. So it was, it was subtle. I mean, she didn't come out and say, your daughter's not smart and, you know, because of this. But the fact that she made an assumption, even though the proof showed she had really high scores. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, I talked to the principal and then she was put in the highest reading group. But a lot of times it's subtleties because it wasn't like in your face. It was like, oh, I thought she guessed. But if you think about the root of that assumption, that feels like a, a microaggression. Absolutely. What about you, Alina? Um, I've experienced a lot of microaggressions uh, growing up mainly. I grew up in Augusta, Georgia, which is a more, um, I guess, red area and um, a, a smaller uh, a smaller city. Mm -hmm. So uh, the people there weren't as open-minded as some of the big cities. Um, and a lot of it had to do with my personal appearance um, because I was maybe one of three uh, people of Asian descent in Augusta. So a lot of the time, if they said anything, it was, oh, you're so pretty for an Asian woman. 
Or you're so exotic looking. Where are you from? Even though I told them I was born and raised in Florida and moved to Georgia, right? So I grew up in the Americas. Um, or, you know, they would uh, mistake me for another Asian woman and then ask me if I was sure that I am me <laughs> because they were so adamant on, um, you know, that that I was Michelle or I was, you know, Linda or whoever that they were talking to. Um, racial blindness is also a real issue, um, oh. you know, and that could also be considered a microaggression because they genuinely don't realize that they are doing it, but it's a type of ignorance that um, everyone should be more aware of. So uh, those are just some examples of, you know, some things I've faced in the past. That's good. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, with this conversation, I think it's going to, you know, bring a lot of awareness to the topic itself. And like I mentioned before, like really give room for conversations to happen, for people to really learn from it, but also grow from it as we continue to evolve. Lakita, I'd like to share, I can think of two experiences as they were speaking. Um, a few years ago, I was in a more rural area of Florida, and I was at a gas station. I was in my luxury car. Uh, I had on a suit for work, and someone came up to me and asked me, well, where are you from? Or are you from here? Uh, or something to that effect. And I'm thinking to myself, I remember I answered, I said, I'm from here. I, <laughs> if I thought that was such an odd question. Uh, and then also another uh, experience I often face is that I am a product of uh, Haitian immigrants. And so when I proudly state that I am of Haitian ethnicity, I usually get the, oh, you don't look Haitian. Uh, and so that is also something that I've uh, encountered quite often. Yeah, I think there's so much that we um, each have probably, you know, individually experienced. I know for myself, you know, back in my days in the corporate world, I definitely have stories for days and I know we, we don't have time for that today, but, um, you know, just one example in particular is I won't name the company, but we would work with different businesses, um, you know, across the state itself. And I would never forget there was a time where there was um, a client that I worked with and we would correspond for some time over the phone. We had never met in person, never had a virtual you know, video call or anything, but there came a point in time, and I would say this was probably about eight months into me working with this client um, that we did set up for a meeting in person. And I will never forget when I showed up um, to their office, one, I was sitting in the lobby for some time, but I was asked on a number of occasions, was I there to perform some type of um, cleaning service? And I was like, no, I'm here to meet with so-and-so. Um, you know, they are the CEO of the business. And when I was finally brought to the conference room when the CEO showed up, I remember the way that he, one, came into the room and the look that he had on his face. And when he sat down, he was like, you don't sound anything like you look. And I remember sitting there and I was like, well, um, we've been corresponding for some time. I believe we built a really great rapport with one another, but just the shock on his face um, and how he interpreted the type of person that I would be from a racial standpoint, just based on how I speak. It was it was really uncomfortable. Um, you know, I do remember leaving that day and just kind of going back to my car and sitting there and just saying, wow, it's amazing to me because that was back in, I'd say, 2022. And I was like, 2022, really? We're still kind of, you know, assuming that if a person talks a certain way, that they're of a certain race versus another, um, am I expected to sound one way because of my current race, with, you know, is African-American? It was just something that I really sat in the car and pondered. Eventually, myself and that CEO, we continued to work together, but I always felt just from that point on that our conversations were just different. It just, it just felt different. Like, it was something that he really had a hard time getting by. <laughs> but I will say, even though that was a tough situation to go through, it taught me, you know, that education is important and conversations like this are important for reasons like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And microaggressions are so common. I think a lot of people of that are different, whether they're, their diversity is their race, their religion, who they love, all of those things. Sometimes we've become so accustomed to them that we don't respond. Yeah. Because they happen all the time. I know uh, there's an author that also calls it subtle acts of exclusion. Mm -hmm. And I always say, because I do training on microaggressions. I mean, the reality is 
we all have committed microaggressions just like they've been committed to us. A lot of it stems from unconscious bias. So sometimes we're not aware, but it's also passed down from generation to generation. Very and much. even when I teach it, I talk about things that I didn't know. A lot of microaggressions became codified almost into our language. So if you think about like master bedroom, now they call it in-law suites, right? So mm-hmm. there are a lot of things that people just said. And unfortunately, we didn't realize that they were microaggressions, right? Because I know the example I use because I try to talk about myself in a way so people can level set and say, okay, let's be real. We all do it. But how can we get better is when I would visit Jamaica and go to the straw markets, I remember parents and colleagues saying, make sure when you go for each one, you need to jew them down and get the best deal. And I don't remember what age I was when I went, what? I did not even realize that was a microaggression. And so I think this conversation is great because we have very well-intended people (laughs) that are offending people every day. And even though it may be micro, the impact is definitely gargantuan. And so I'm glad we're having this conversation so we can all do the work, learn, and remove those types of things from our uh, repertoire of conversational words. Absolutely. So uh, I know we started off this podcast with you all sharing uh, your personal experience with microaggressions, but I wanted to know, and if you could share with us uh, any common examples of microaggressions that you've experienced uh, in the workplace or maybe even your school setting. Um, Aline, I'll start with you. In the work setting and in school, uh, they, they're definitely different. Um, personally, in the workplace, I have not experienced much um microaggressions there thank goodness um i am uh more young in my career you know i've been an hr journalist for about five years now but um i'm not very client facing therefore the people and and the people i've worked with are amazing like nadia so um i've been very grateful for that experience however in school uh mainly where i grew up um most people assumed i was very good at math and that i was extremely smart um, now I did do very well in math and I did do very well in school, but that was because I am, I, I, I was blessed. You know, I, I do study very hard and, um, I do grasp onto things pretty quickly fitting that stereotype, but it just, it, it, it seems like it's a positive stereotype. So that's why people say it, but it takes away from who I am as a person and my skill set, because there are a lot of Asian people who are not gifted in that sense at all. Um, so th- that was pretty much the main one that I heard throughout school, um, if not about my appearance, um, the things that I mentioned earlier. What about you, Deloria? Yeah, there's a ton of them. I mean, you know, micro invalidations is one that's huge where they act like people don't hear you or see you. So, you know, there's a conversation, someone comes up with this amazing idea Maybe it's a woman and people just walk past it. And then a little later, the guy says the same idea. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my goodness, what a great idea. So micro invalidations are very common. Uh, Along the lines of micro invalidations is the assumptions of where people belong. So, you know, you have a 25-year-old new executive show up and she's told to go to the 15th floor where the interns are, as opposed to the 22nd floor where the uh, executives are, you know, assumption based on age where she should fit. Uh, And I could go on and on and they happen all the time of gender restrictive roles is one of inevitably when I'm talking to executives, especially executive women, if there is not an administrative person in the meeting, they tend to always ask the woman to take the notes, right? Even if that's not her gift of Assuming, you know, if you're Hispanic, you're from a large family. Wow, how many is it of, of you all? Uh, but I also use the example that Elena did. Like, you know, it's very unfair. You know, I have friends that are Asian that say, I am not analytical. So don't make that assumption and give me that project because that's not my thing. And uh, it, it's it's so commonplace that people don't even realize it of religious um, microaggressions. My sister is Muslim now, right? And we grew up Christian. So even in our own family, not understanding and making judgments, like that seems unhealthy to fast like that. Why would they do that? Right. Or she seems like such an intelligent woman. Why would she be Muslim? Right. So there's 
on and on and on and on, but they happen every day. And I like to talk about it like kind of like mosquito bites, right? You know, if you get a mosquito bite, you're not going to dial 911 or go to the hospital, but mosquito bites can change the environment, especially depending on the number of you get. And I remember I had a friend that had a party outside in Florida and we were having a good time and then dusk came. And all of a sudden, these ferocious mosquitoes were like attacking and they literally picked up furniture and moved it inside. And I love that analogy because microaggressions change the work environment because it may seem small to you, but you don't know how many times a person has had microaggressions hurled at them. And so when they react, you think it's an overreaction, but maybe they've been bitten 30 times when you have only been bitten once. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy. (laughs) So in your opinion, ladies, what psychological effects can microaggressions have on individuals and even communities? And I'll start with you on that one, Deloria. Yeah, I mean, stress of burnout. uh, There's something called racial trauma. I mean, it really makes you feel like you don't belong. And depending on your personality, the other things that have happened in your life, it could make you start doubting your your talent because every time you start, you know, it's the same questions over and over. Oh, you're the new diversity hire, which is the way of saying you didn't earn it. So I loved when that happened recently and somebody said DEI stands for definitely earned it. I'm like, okay, I'm with that. It makes you just feel like you don't belong. I mean, you think about when you were young and we all wanted to get picked for that team, right? Pick me, pick me. And you're waiting and waiting. The more people make assumptions about who you are or who you aren't before they really understand and just the little slights like, When you said yourself, although you and the uh, CEO had a great rapport, after he made that slight, it -hmm. changes things. And so your level of trust, the ability to build a relationship, and even your ability to excel in the company. I mean, I've seen microaggressions in performance reviews. When I was in trial review performance reviews, and I saw one and it was like, oh, you know, she has really great communication skills. I was so surprised. I know mm-hmm. you're talking about somebody black. It's like, uh, change that. And so it impacts everything, how we live, how we work, what we earn, and mm-hmm. our ability to feel like we belong so we can focus, do our job, and thrive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What about yourself, Alina? What are your thoughts on that? So obviously your your mental health suffers because you don't feel like you belong. You don't, you start feeling abnormal. Like you're not accepted in society or that culture that you have been invited into, whether that is school, whether that is work. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also believe that everything becomes about your race or your age or whatever they are having that microaggression about um, because you feel like you can't escape it. There's nothing that you can change about your race or your, your age. You know, you feel trapped practically. Uh-huh. Communities, I feel like, especially specifically the Asian community, there's this feeling of learned helplessness. There's nothing we can do about it. So we make fun of ourselves. I have seen Asians make fun of themselves and, and at the expense of other people. And, you know, everyone just goes along with it because, oh, they're making fun of themselves. So it's OK. Or they just accept it because it's a part of their lives now instead of correcting others, instead of standing up for themselves. And that might honestly have to do with the Asian culture because we tend to be extremely passive. This is something passed down from our um, elders. Uh, When we came here into this country, it was just a blessing to be in this country. And we should turn the other cheek, you know, keep our head down and do what we do well. But when it comes to more political things or things that have to do with our race, um, this is something that is should just be ignored because we are blessed just to be here. So um, that that's a little slightly different when it comes to Asian communities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That makes sense. And, you know, even when I think about this type of question from like HR perspective, it's definitely important that we recognize microaggressions because as we're talking about here, although they can be subtle, they can have lasting and profound psychological effects on individuals. You know, when employees experience these type of behaviors, you know, whether it's through comments, actions, or even exclusion itself, they may feel 
devalued, they might feel marginalized or even simply misunderstood. And over time, it can lead to things like anxiety, depression, as well as a decrease in like the overall job satisfaction and engagement, which I myself have seen happen in businesses. And when we think about it like on a much broader you know, level, especially within um, a community itself or a workplace community, rather, it can create like a toxic culture that diminishes trust. It stifles collaboration and it definitely erodes, you know, the sense of belonging for people. They might feel that they constantly have to prove themselves, you know, which can lead to burnout, just as you had mentioned, Deloria, and even emotional exhaustion. Okay. And it not only is the dollars lost. I mean, it yes. about yeah. it. there are studies about depression and burnout yeah. and the billions of dollars that companies lose because of the missed work days, because mm-hmm. of that. So it's going to end impact the productivity, the attendance, all of mm-hmm. the above. Yeah, it, it definitely impacts, you know, the organization as oh, a whole yeah. itself. And so that's why it's important to like address these type of, you know, psychological effects, because to me, it involves just much more than even awareness. It requires, you know, creating safe spaces for like open dialogue, um, training on cultural competency and just even fostering like an environment, you know, where all voices are heard and definitely valued. And by doing this, we can shift culture away from microaggressions and simply towards like inclusion and respect. No, I love that. When I do the training, I do the uh, anonymous polls because I think what happens is there are a lot of good companies doing good work, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they're free of microaggressions. So I love doing the poll because inevitably when I do the poll, usually about 70% of people or more say they've experienced microaggressions at work. And the leaders are like, you know, like clutch my pearls, but they need to understand that it's something that happens all the time. But talking about it, explaining what it is can create an environment where people can have the language to disarm it and talk about it. But I think a lot of companies are in denial. But if you really asked people, especially anonymously, you would be surprised at how often it happens and how it's touched just about everybody. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I think even for some companies that are in denial, it could be a measure of fear as well as to, well, this is now brought to my attention. Now what? You know, how is it going to impact a company? What can we do about it? Or do we we even want to do anything about it (laughs) or know how? (laughs) Well, let's move on to the next question. So what steps uh, can individuals take to become more aware of their own microaggressions? I would say, if I might tune in, um, that... If everyone needs to be a little bit more um, conscious about the words that you choose within the workplace. So if the words that you're about to say have to do anything with anyone's or something that words that have to do with something that they can't change, whether that is race, whether that is age, whether that is a disability, um, just reevaluate what you are thinking and, and ask yourself, can this offend somebody even in a way that I am not aware of? And, you know, just choosing your words carefully, thinking before you speak. A lot of people are just on autopilot all day, right? Um, There's no filter um, for for some people. And it is harder for some people than others. But by reevaluating what you are thinking, that can already prevent a lot of accidental microaggressions from being spilled. Um, Also, I would say that they can speak to people of different ethnicities and ask them, Truthfully, I've said this before. Do you think that this would be offensive? And you can't just talk to one person's opinion or like one one friend because one friend might think it's okay. But speaking to a community of people, speaking to multiple ethnic people of a certain race, of a certain ethnicity, and asking them, is is this like I've said before? Oh, I think it's a compliment saying that Asians are good at math. What do you think about that? Right? Just as an example, because that one person's defense may not be representative of the whole community. Um, And then remember that a lot of Asians already have that internalized racism. And so maybe one person is like, oh, it's fine. But that's because they've been already beaten down by the slews of uh, microaggressions, like the 30, 100 hurled at them. And they're like, well, it's okay." Versus someone who's only been through one or two, they might have a different opinion. So getting that opinion from your peers, even as long as it's someone you trust and they they can give... um, legit feedback. I think that's good advice. I also think that knowledge is power and most microaggressions stem from unconscious bias. And so 
I think we have to level set and tell the truth that all of us are biased. So one of the things that I would recommend is to go to implicit.harvard.edu and take the implicit bias test because it's going to help you understand where your biases exist, not if you have bias, we all do where they are. And if you know that, then you can kind of be more aware. Like I know where my biases are, so I'm more aware. And you can even create like an action plan of to, to, to try to do better, right? They say, my grandmother used to say, when you know better, you do better. And uh, that hope springs eternal. The other thing I would say is to slow down. Uh, Similar to what Elena said, uh, there's a book called Thinking Fast and Slow uh, by a psychologist of Daniel Kahneman, I think is his name. And he shows that most of unconscious bias happens when we're moving fast, Uh, that we have two brain systems. One is uh, system one, which is almost like autopilot. You're just kind of doing it. And system two, which requires more more thoughtful, slowed down thinking. And so when you're on autopilot, your brain box opens up and all of those stereotypes or things you put in there are just going to kind of blurt out. And you may say it, you may not, but it impacts the decisions that you make. But when you pause and you slow down, you can be more intentional. So slowing down is definitely some of it. Learning the biases that you have yourself and also having the courage to challenge things that are being passed down from family to family. Once I learned the thing about the comments of, I went back and talked to people. There's a really good uh, video that Verna Myers does on uh, unconscious bias. And she talked about how we have to challenge people in our families, even though we say they're old and set in their ways. Because like she says, the person that's also around the dinner table are our kids. And if Uncle Joe or whoever can say things and we don't challenge it, a lot of times the younger people think that it's true and that bias or microaggressions continues to get passed on generation to generation. That is definitely some good information, um, Deloria. And I'm actually going to, you know, take that assessment myself because I think just like you mentioned, it's a great way to really bring a lot of self-awareness and you can see exactly where you stand and how can you even grow further from it. Yeah. And they have a million batteries. They have them on race, on sex. They have them on weight. They mm-hmm. have on beauty because there's beauty bias and all this stuff. So it's oh, really, yeah. it's just, it's just good to know yourself and, mm-hmm. you know, don't have to share what you got. Just work on it and uh, right. it's getting better. <laughs> right, right. You both share just a lot of great just feedback and, you know, the steps that someone can take. And it actually is, you know, kind of leads into the next question I had, which is kind of similar in a little way. And that is like, how can someone effectively respond to a microaggression, like when they either witnessed it happening to somebody else or even experienced it directly themselves? The most simple way to do that is just to speak up, right? Um, A lot of people are afraid uh, that they will come off as too aggressive. In, in response to that microaggression, because microaggression is small, right? So most people don't even realize that they're doing it. Um, but I, I think just bringing it up in a very respectful way, saying, hey, what you just said, I know that you didn't mean to hurt me in any way or how you just reacted, but technically that does offend me because of X, Y, Z. Um, and then it'll explain a little bit about it because this person probably didn't even know that they offended you in that way. Um, and obviously, the, depending on the situation, if it's a manager or if it's a friend, you would approach this situation a little bit differently. But um, having that conversation is the first step. Yeah. And I think you can ask questions, you know, wow, you know, you're really of articulate. Of What do you mean by that? Right. It's a mm-hmm. compliment. But if we rewind it, it's based on the thought that people that look like me aren't. So what do you mean? Or, you know, I'm, I have a master's degree and I've worked in HR 30 years. My undergrad is in communications. What do you mean? Sometimes you just have to say, help me understand what you mean by that. Because sometimes people don't hear themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the the most injurious thing we can do is ignore it, right? Because once we ignore it, then we miss the learning opportunity for that person. So they're going to share it again, right? And maybe the next person they share it with may not be so forgiving of so of a Jan Levan Zant used to say, speak the truth and speak it quick. And I love that statement. I think you have to address it. I also always talk about leading with love. 
And sometimes it's tough love, right? Because if I care about you, should I allow you to keep doing things that could impact you negatively in the future? Mm -hmm. So I think you just say, help me understand what you mean by that. Uh, You realize that could be interpreted this way. And then it's like, oh my goodness, I didn't mean that. And I mean, once again, intent versus impact. I didn't say that was the intent, but the impact of these types of comments could be X, Y, Z. I think that is so good, Deloria. You know, I I really wish I would have had you as the mentor as I was going through my corporate time in HR, because I cannot tell you how many times I actually had that specific comment, whether it was in interviews or just I would hear from managers. You're always so articulate and eloquent in your speaking. And I would sit there and I wouldn't really know what to say. And I'm like, but do you expect something else? I'm like, I just wish you were my mentor. <laughs> We can pretend to go back for a day and I could be Absolutely. on the shoulder. <laughs> but here's the thing. I now know. <laughs> right. and, you know the thing it was so important is to be timely in your response. Yeah. Uh, because if you miss that opportunity uh, or you wait a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and you bring it back up to the individual, then there's a great chance they're not going to remember mm-hmm. uh, what they've said. So it's just so important to address it in that moment. And, you know, as I was listening to the conversation, you know, my experience, I, I uh, thought about anxiety that I used to have whenever I would come to work with a new hairdo. And so because I knew that the next day I was going to get a million comments and I always have to say, you know, yes, my hair was short yesterday, but now it's, you know, down my back today. And mm-hmm. and uh, there would be assumptions that that was the real length of my hair or and so finally, my response used to always be, uh, yes, my hair changes every six weeks. Get used to it. <laughs> and so that was my way to address it. So uh, it's a real thing. And, and I didn't really realize uh, until we were talking about the emotions that come with uh, microaggressions that uh, I always had that anxiety before walking into the workplace. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did you do that last night? Like I'd have braids and it's like, yeah, I didn't sleep at all. I stayed up all night and braided my hair. <laughs> but, you know, I try to have an open attitude about it because I know sometimes people really don't know. Yeah, um, There was a situation I was at the airport and when I don't have my hair up like this, my locks are really long and someone was touching my hair and I didn't realize them. And my husband was like, that white lady was touching your hair. And I was like, yeah, I don't care. Cause she was curious. And I always tell people, don't try this at home. Right. Cause you may get a different person, but I try to stay open because I feel like if you can teach people, mm-hmm. then they will do better, especially if their intent is innocent of. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to share the impact of comments and behaviors, because a lot of times People may care about you and they really wouldn't have intentionally did it. So you don't give them a pass by ignoring it, but you have to address it so they can learn and hopefully not offend other people. What roles uh, or what role do bystanders and allies play and how can they best support individuals who are affected by microaggression? And then what are some common mistakes to avoid in this support? Um, I feel like some common mistakes would be to make it about them, trying to relate to you in a way that you probably could or, you know, that they can't probably relate to. Um, another thing I would say is being dismissive of it, just saying, hey, it was it was just an awe comment. Everyone does it just because everyone does it does not make it OK. The fact that everyone does it says that there is some some issue to be addressed. Um and how we can, how someone can be supportive, um, just listen, active listening and validating their experience saying like, I did not know you went through that, or that must be very hard because I can't relate, I, you know, or I can relate in this way, but not, not fully. Um, and just being empathetic overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think allies, a allies is, it should be an action word, right? So I don't think you should just sit there and not say anything. A lot of times the person who is the target of the microaggression, sometimes they're so shocked. They don't know what to say. And so having an ally intervene and say, hey, I'm not sure what you meant when you said that you're a credit to your race. What do you what are you saying? Well, no, I'm complimenting her. You do realize that could be considered a microaggression because Has anybody ever said that to you or 
I think you have to jump in uh, and address it then, uh, especially as a leader. Uh, the level of detail or specificity you go into it really does depend on the audience and the severity of it. You know, was it a micro assault, a macro invalidation? But the worst thing you can do is immediately jump to the person's defense when someone tells you about it. So I go to Nadia and say, hey, Nadia, you know, I'm really upset. I just had a conversation with Lakita and she said something that was very offensive. Oh, I know Lakita. She would never do anything like that. Lakita is the sweetest person. She would. And I, all of that may be true, but I'm just telling you that she offended me. And what I have found is sometimes the defense of the person who made the slight is so strong. The conversation is now about that person and everybody protecting who they are and coddling them, that the person that got offended, who was the target, they've been brushed aside. And it happens more than you would realize. And, oh, no, they would never. And it's like, well, you know, so one of the things I teach, and I learned it, that of not willing to acknowledge a microaggression is a microaggression itself because you take away the language and the ability to deal with what has happened. You know, oh, no, it, it, people don't do that anymore. She didn't mean that. That's per perpetuating it more because now I don't even have a safe space to talk about it because you're basically telling me that I'm crazy or I should ignore it or you know what they meant by it. You know, you don't know what they meant. Uh, nobody knows a person's intent, but I can definitely tell you the impact that it had on me. And so allies and bystanders can do a great work but they can also do a huge disservice by jumping in and creating a defense before acknowledging the impact that it had on whoever of was the person, the target of the microaggression. And I think even, you know, when it comes to something like that, you diminish that person's experience, you know, by like you were saying, Deloria, it's almost like you've now erased that safe space of them now feeling comfortable to come and, you know, bring information like that to your attention because now they know well, it's like I have to now prove myself. I have to prove that it's true. And you don't give room for, oh, wait a minute, maybe this did occur. Right. Let me take my lens off and look at it from this person's point of view. Yeah, absolutely. So ladies, in your experience, how do microaggressions differ and impact itself like when they occur in a professional setting compared to maybe a personal or even social environment? I feel like when it occurs in a work environment, it's more about the person's uh, skill set, typically. Um, it's usually uh, you, you speak so well or, oh, you're so good at this because you are this, right? Or, oh, you're so whatever for a woman, right? So it's usually a skill-based thing that someone points out versus in society, I feel like they feel like it's more okay to mention your appearance um, because of obviously in the workplace, most people do understand and know you really shouldn't talk about race and politics, right? Those are the two, like one of the two things or in religion, of course, um, you could get in trouble with HR. So they have this kind of um, fear in, in the workplace, but it, now it's okay when you step outside of that and there are no rules. Um, it's okay to make more comments about how someone looks or how their hair looks, you know, um, I would say that's that's the main difference. Yeah, I think the difference is the impact of at work is so much more detrimental, right? It can impact your ability to be promoted. It can impact your performance review. And the way you respond is being recorded, right? I mean, if you respond in a way that appears to be aggressive, then that reinforces some of the stereotypes, right? Of the angry black woman or so-and-so is overly sensitive. But to not do it, it is really, could be devastating, right? It's not just someone who passes me in the grocery store and says something, right? And I, the other thing I think is the response can, can be different, right? If I'm not at work, I can respond however I want to respond. I don't have to get anxious about 
saying it just the right way so so and so doesn't think I'm aggressive. I mean, I don't have to have all these conversations. I'm, you know, off work. It's me. You say something ignorant. You may, you know, <laughs> you you may get the response that you obviously w- was asking for, right? But I'm not gonna think through it so much because. I don't have to come back to you, right? You think about how much time we spend at work. I may, my feelings may have been hurt. You said something, but I got to come back the next day and the next day and the next day. This is my other home. And so I just think it's horrible in general, but when it's at work, to not address it is opening the doors and creating room for so many other things that could have a long-term effect on your ability Your ability to thrive and grow in that environment, but you have to address it. But the, the way you respond is going to create a, a sense of anxiety on its own because you're going to be judged sometimes more harshly by the way you respond than the person that made the comment, unfortunately. I would actually like to um, follow up on that. I think you're completely right. You know, that is a very, very good point. I never even thought about it that way. Um, personally, um, uh, I haven't had many microaggressions in the workplace as a lot of Asian stereotypes are that we are very good at our work. We are very smart. We are very capable um, at work. So we do get less micromanaging. We do get, you know, like a lot more support in, in what we do, which is wrong because obviously if someone is Asian does not mean that they're going to work well. However, um, I feel like for me, the impact on uh, my appearance and and my my culture outside of the workplace has affected me more personally. Um, mental health. I've had mental health issues since I was eight years old because of all these microaggressions being pointed towards me and how I look. So now I am extremely self conscious about my face, my body, my hair. Um, and I'm not saying that you know African Americans don't face this as well, of course, but the the long term impact of uh, being analyzed and being fetishized or being hated because of um, how I look all the time is exhausting. So that is another social aspect to to also bring up. That's good. Yeah, I mean, not what's happened, but just the perspective and how the impact can be. Yeah. I mean, that's why, yeah, that's why one size never fits all, right? Right, right. So my next question is that how can organizations and institutions uh, create effective training programs to address and reduce microaggressions among their members? Acknowledge the existence is the first thing, right? Just because it's micro doesn't mean it needs to be ignored because it can grow. So acknowledging it and having the conversation, even talking about what they are, because a lot of times people don't realize that that's a microaggression. Girl, you know what I was saying? That's a compliment. You know, Asians are smart. They're the model minority. So you have to talk about it. Uh, To me, give people space to learn how to address them of challenge leaders as well as allies to address it. Uh, there's a really good book called Inclusive Conversations that I absolutely love by of uh, Mary Frances Winters. And it talks about just understanding how to have these inclusive conversations. So I think acknowledging it, I think doing the polls help so you realize it's real and just giving people the language and the opportunity to address it in a way that is not always punitive. I think the worst thing we can do sometimes is create a sterile work environment where, to Alinda's point, everybody is being so PC because they're afraid to get in trouble. When we create those environments, real dialogue, real relationships, trust doesn't happen because no one is being real. So right. you know, level set, hey, we all do it. I've done it myself, but we want to get better. We're not saying we have a horrible organization. We have a great organization. But continuous improvement means going from good to great. We're going to have these training programs. We're going to have these real dialogues so we can do that introspection and self-work so that we can get better and better. And we are encouraging you, if you see something, say something, and we'll try to give you the language to be able to address it in a way that makes it better for everybody. And when it comes to training, I would say to pick training that is also um 
inclusive of a lot of aspects. So Absolutely. not only just race, but again, disability, gender, age, right. because all of those affect everyone. It can, you know, some, um, some of those things have uh, different effects, different um, you know results. So uh, getting a training that is all inclusive and comprehensive is is important because you Absolutely. hopefully have a diverse workplace um and we want to be able to touch on uh, a little bit of everything yeah and you know one recommendation i uh, read about was to actually hire an industrial and organizational psychologist so that will be alina's area when she gets her master's but that is one way as well if you want to combat microaggressions in the workplace yeah, and just to make sure to your point that it's all inclusive, when I do the training, we have a whole section and I say microaggressions is an equal opportunity offender, right? So definitely religion, age, um, disability status is so many things and LGBTQ status. And it's shocking, but it's so common. I mean, and when you look at it, you go, no one would say that. There's one when I talk about the LGBTQ plus people will say, well, who's the male and who's the female in the relationship? And people go, nobody. And when I have friends that I ask them, they say, oh yeah, people ask me that all the time. I mean, it is so ridiculous. Or even with age, I use this example. My mom is 88 and she lives with us now and we walk and do things. But one of the neighbors who I know loves my mom and respects her, her voice changes when she talks to my mom. She almost starts talking to her almost like a baby and says stuff like, oh, she's cute. Come on with it. Yeah. And so it's not intentional, but all of a sudden, because she's elderly now, that same level of respect shifts. So we would be surprised at how much people deal with microaggressions every day, and they definitely impact all dimensions of diversity. Absolutely. That's really good information from both of you guys that you shared. Um, I'm curious, though, are there any, you know, specific like strategies or tools that either of you guys have definitely found like help, like helpful or just when it comes to healing and simply coping with the effects of microaggressions? Therapy. <laughs> the most <laughs> low biggest one. Um, I'm not going to lie, because talking to friends, um, as much as I do, even with my my Asian friends, um, they can validate what I've been through, but they still haven't been through the exact same things that I have. Maybe they've had the same things said at them, but the frequency is not the same. So um, I definitely had to go to therapy to to really um, feel more secure in myself and work through my own traumas. Because not only does microaggressions, you know, they they build up, but it also kind of um overlaps with the trauma that you already have in your everyday personal life right everyone has their own mental health struggles so um whatever you're going through besides the microaggressions can really influence how you perceive microaggressions and how you you internalize them um so therapy is my 100 no, percent number one um way of dealing with it but also uh after therapy they'll obviously probably give you some type of um exercises to go through and i feel that being kind to yourself as much as possible participating in self-care activities to um kind of be sure wh whether it is your appearance whether it's your skill whether it is whatever it is um participating in a self-care activity that strengthens that your identity, you know, feeling secure in whatever you have been made feel insecure about um, is important. Yeah, I would say, of, I mean, if we listen to this and we listen to Elena, it talks about the impact. We talked about that. And I mean, the impact that has been so severe that it causes a person to need therapy. So I think if anybody's listening, you have to realize there's nothing micro about it. So I would start there. But I would say, hopefully, you get to it maybe before it needs that. Some of it is the the teaming. I think employee resource groups talking to other people. Definitely self-care affirmations. You know, I am strong. I am beautiful. I am brilliant. I belong. Of, I think telling yourself the truth and surrounding yourself with people who see you, right? All of you, they see you and you can be your authentic self of, you know, no one should have to be perfect 
to succeed at work because nobody is. Of, I just think really self love, understanding that uh, we were all created the way we were supposed to be. I don't know who you pray to, but I don't think the creator made a mistake, right? He didn't stop and take a break when I came through to be designed. And so we all have our looks, our personalities, our skill set, and it makes everything better. But I agree, sometimes people can beat you down so much till you can't even see you anymore. Mm -hmm. Or depending on the culture, you've stuffed it all. So you keep taking it, you keep taking it, you keep stuffing it. And now you're really at the point of responding, of knowing your triggers, right? Sometimes there are things you can do in stress. There's a lot of stress management tools. ACE Academy is something that has micro learnings. And there's a section on stress and burnout. Uh, one of my favorite courses is journaling for stress relief, right? Sometimes journaling helps you to understand how you feel, uh, knowing good stress, bad stress, understanding your triggers, because sometimes the way we respond to stuff, to Elena's point, it may not be the one thing, but it's the culmination, right? So I've dealt with 10,000. And so now this last one, I'm responding and everybody's looking like that was strong but you don't know all the things I've already stuffed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, in therapy, like, you know, people, religion, I say you can have, go to church and have a therapist, right? Because all of it helps us. Absolutely. I don't think you should choose, but, you know, having a coach, sometimes having a coach of helps of, and just having people that validate you. But Mm -hmm. all of that is for not if you don't believe it and haven't gotten to a point of self-validation. Absolutely. And I definitely wanted to add as well, you know, when we think about um, healing from microaggressions, it's really all about building awareness as we're talking about here, but also resilience, both individually as well as collectively. So I love what you had mentioned, Alina, about therapy, because that is certainly a helpful way to seek support um, and how we can navigate through any type of experiences you may have, you know, had along the way. Also trusted mentors. Um, affinity groups are also good. It's all about having like a safe space to, uh, you know, discuss any types of experiences, emotions, and then validating those feelings as well. Um, You also mentioned, you know, practicing self-care. I think that's a great one, as well as setting boundaries and engaging in mindfulness. It can definitely help individuals manage stress and the emotional toll of microaggressions itself. And from an organizational standpoint, when we think about HR playing a pivotal role and not only creating but promoting more awareness around microaggressions, they can have support networks like an employee resource groups or otherwise known as ERGs. And those type of groups, they offer, you know, a platform for shared experiences as well as collective healing. Additionally, of course, ongoing training on diversity, equity, as well as con- inclusion. It ensures that all employees, especially from those, you know, with historically marginalized groups, that they're equipped with tools to address microaggressions when they occur, whether it's direct communication or just reporting mechanisms itself. And another, you know, tool that I've seen personally that's worked really well uh, in this space is bystander intervention training. And that type of training, it empowers others in the workplace to step in and address microaggressions as they're happening. And it not only shifts the burden off the individual experiencing it, but it also fosters a much more supportive environment. So ultimately, it's about creating a culture of accountability itself. I feel like that's a key. You know, open dialogue, clear policies, and getting leadership buy-in, which can start earn moments of microaggressions, you know, into opportunities for growth as well as greater understanding. Absolutely. Well, you know, I thank you all for sharing because I believe all these resources, it's definitely going to help someone that's listening to this podcast today. Uh, but I have one final question, and that is, you know, what role does intersectionality play in the experience of microaggressions, and how can understanding this concept help in addressing these issues more effectively? Everybody doesn't experience the same thing, right? Because they have lived experiences. So you have intersectionality. I'll give you an example. Maybe if I was, uh, I mean, an African-American woman or an African-American woman in the LGBTQ group, 
we don't experience life the same. It's kind of that one size fits all. So I like to say it's like the Facebook status is complicated, right? So I think the intersectionality, depending on the different layers of diversity lenses or diversity of categories that you fit in, probably, I hate to say it, subjects you to even more, right? Because if I'm a Black woman with a disability who loves another woman, (laughs) you know, I got the race piece, I got the disability piece, I got the LGBTQ plus piece. I mean, and the thing is, there's so many layers of our identity that people can't see, right? I love that iceberg experience. You know, people think about what they can see. So you can see that I'm a Black woman, but you don't know who I love. You don't know my socioeconomic background. You don't know if I'm dealing with mental health traumas. I mean, there's so many things. And I think intersectionality makes it more complicated. But that's why I think people have to speak for themselves so you can understand the layers and the dynamics. Because, you know, it's like when you have the ERGs, employee resource groups, and you have them for women. A lot of times, if you notice, there are a lot of times people that may be Black or of African descent will tend to move more toward the Black ERG, right? And then a lot of times the women's ERG is typically white women or a few other, because the experience is not the same. So I think we just have to listen and learn because the intersectionalities mean that we experience life as well as microaggressions differently. I I would just like to follow up and say it's it's complicated. It's very yeah. complicated because you can't tell what people identify with mm-hmm. as. Um, so. Uh, if anything, just being extra careful, like thinking before you speak, pausing before you speak and having, you know, um, it, can I, is this something that I could say that is hurtful or, you know, and if you do make a mistake, because everyone does, especially if there is something that we cannot see, um, apologize and and take that and reflect on it. It doesn't have to be like, a, oh, I feel so bad. I feel so guilty. But it's it's a learning experience. And it's something that you should take and and hopefully improve. Yeah, I came up with an acronym AAK: acknowledge, apologize, and keep learning. Right? Well, well not about you. Just I am so sorry. I did that. That was not my intent. I need to go back and study. You know, can you share more? Maybe the person wants to. Maybe they're so offended they don't want to. Don't make the target your teacher. <laughs> they don't have to be, but if they're open enough, that's great. But go back and do the work. But acknowledge that you did it. Because once again, it's about the impact. And so many people get into their head about their intent that now they're making it about them. You know me, girl, you know, I would never, we don't have time for all that. Just say, I'm so sorry. That wasn't my intent. I'm going to keep learning. Uh, Are there some resources you can point me to or, you know, but acknowledge, apologize, keep learning. I absolutely love that. And I will be utilizing that, Deloria. So, of course. <laughs> Ladies, this has been such a great conversation. As we prepare to wrap up this discussion today, one, I just keep talking to you guys both because there's just so much that you're saying that I just, I'm gleaning from. But I'm curious is there any last thoughts or um, wisdom nuggets you'd like to leave our audience with before we conclude today's discussion? Um, again, I want to thank you for having me on here. Um, and I feel like we, we were very thorough. Uh, but one thing I would like to reiterate, um, because Loria kind of mentioned it before, but everyone has their own experience. You don't know what anyone has been going through. Um, you know, who knows how many years of trauma, if they do have that, um, can affect them. And one microaggression can, you know, affect someone's life heavily, like push them over the brink, whether that is at work or in their social life. So just be kind to others and um, uh, continue to learn, uh, be open to learning um, about microaggressions and other things in the uh, diversity in the workforce. What about you, Deloria? Yeah, I think it boils down to respect and inclusion, right? Uh, Everyone deserves a right to be where they are, whether it's at work, whether it's just existing, and bring all of their beautiful gifts and talents, even if it's not those that you appreciate. So I think if you just respect a person's right to to exist and to live, and I love it, and to just be kind, think before you speak. Uh, and when you make a mistake, because we will really learn from it 
and don't take it personally, but learn the lesson so you don't keep doing it. Oh, that's no big deal. You're being sensitive. No, 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 no. Learn so that you won't do it as much. Because if we think about how these things make us feel, uh, most of us, I would say, don't really want to make a person feel bad. And so respect, inclusion, and just keep learning. That's great advice from you both. Thank you so much. You know, as we, you know, close out this first part of our conversation on microaggressions, it's important to remember that the small everyday interactions we have with others, it can either uplift or harm. Microaggressions, they may seem subtle, but their impact is real and lasting. And our hope, you know, is that today's discussion itself has sparked awareness as well as empathy in recognizing these types of behaviors. And change, it definitely begins with us as individuals and as a community. And it's through reflection, open dialogue, and intentional action that we can create more inclusive and supportive workplaces. Let this be a reminder that our journey itself toward equity isn't about being perfect, but about being accountable. It's about learning as well as growing together. So stay tuned for part two, where we'll dive deeper into, you know, how can we collectively address and overcome these challenges? And please uh, know that we are always looking for your feedback and any questions or even uh, opportunities for us to have future episodes and the topic that you'd like to see. So please keep in touch with us at our website or at uh, goshorm.org and also our email, which is diversity at goshorm.org. Thanks so much again for tuning in today, guys. And thank you again to both Ms. Deloria Nelson Street as well as Alina. You guys have been incredible. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone.